This morning, police report overall crime is down in the city, but why is there a rise in murders and shootings? We'll hear from Chief of the Department, Terry Monahan, and we'll be joined by two Jewish community leaders to discuss the alarming rise in anti-Semitism. Now, from 42nd and 2nd, this is New York's very own PIX11 News Close-Up with Marvin Scott. Good morning. The NYPD proudly announced this past week that crime in the city last year reached a record low. Now, that may depend on how you read the numbers. Overall, crime is down. But homicides, they were up 318 in 2019. That's 23 more than the previous year. And there's also an increase in shootings and robberies, plus a 20% spike in hate crimes, predominantly against the Jewish community. Joining me now to talk about this and more, I'm pleased to welcome Terry Monahan, chief of the department of the NYPD. In a few moments, I'll be joined by two leaders of the Jewish community. Thanks for coming in. Good morning, Robin. Now let's, let's talk about these numbers. You talk about a record low. How do you reconcile that with the spike in murders and, and, and other felony crimes, robberies, shootings? Well, when we look at shootings, uh, you got to take it in context. This is the third year in a row. We've ended up the year with under 800 shootings. Just five years ago, we'd never been below 1,100. But any increase that we see is concerning. You know, we don't want to say, ah, it's up only a little. Our goal is to bring it back down some more. And that's what we do. We look at the gang activity. We look at what precipitated a shoot and see how we can prevent it. There's a small crew of people out there that are willing to take out a gun and shoot somebody on the streets. And it's our job to make sure we're identifying who they are and getting them off the streets as quickly as we can. Do you feel these shootings are mostly gang related? A good majority have some sort of nexus to gangs or drugs. So we want to make sure that we are going after those individuals who are willing to bring out a gun and take, uh, take a shot at somebody. Now, I saw a figure staggering 95,000 criminal incidents all in total in New York City all of last year. Yes. Now, that would include misdemeanors that, and... No, 95,000. That's felonies? the seven major index crimes that get reported to the FBI every year. This uh, is the third year in a row that we've come in with under 100,000 index crimes. We had never done that uh, before. So it's been remarkable, the decreases that we've been able to get in total index crime. That includes robberies, burglaries, grand larcenies, homicides, and... Uh, and felonious assault. So when you add up all seven, we've been down consistently now year after year. But any rise in crime, especially robberies, is very concerning to us. And we're seeing a, a real increase in youth robberies over the last six months of last year. So it's something that we're going to be addressing. But a decline, you had a decline in burglaries and rapes. But the rape thing is because they're underreported? We, we had increases for years in rapes. And this year was a decrease, a slight decrease, a very slight decrease in rapes, um, 2%. But it's, a, it's traditionally been an underreported crime, so we encourage people to come forward because we want to be able to get to the individuals that are involved. So if an incident happens, we encourage people to come forward, come forward, and we'll deal with the survivors. Let me ask you about this, this awful murder of uh, the uh, Barnard freshman test and test uh, you, you have two teens in custody, and there's a third who has not been arrested yet. Could you tell us, could you oh, share any of that? Currently there's one teen that is in custody that was uh, taken in and charged uh, very quickly after the crime. Two other teens that we've brought in with their, uh, with their guardians and with legal representation. We talked to them, we took some uh, forensic evidence and it's something that we're working hand in hand with the uh, Manhattan DAs to make sure that if we are going to charge these uh, other two individuals, that we're going to put together as strong a case possible. You do believe these two others were implicated in the, in the murder? We believe that they are involved in the, in the murder, but we want to make sure that uh, we're putting together a, a proper case that can go forward. But one of them who actually did the stabbing, who's one of these two? That is part of the investigation. It's part of what we believe. Now, I know the trial begins for the 13-year-old. It's been set for March 12th. So that will go. Do you expect to have the others in custody by then? Uh, again, we're working hand in hand with Cy Vance and his unit, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to make some progress on it shortly. Now, this crime took part in uh, took place in Morningside Park. Has there been any increase in security? Any new measures taken to surveillance? Yes. We've put a lot of uh, a lot of new personnel, a lot of personnel in and around the park, covered patrol. So if you go to that park, you're going to see a police officer somewhere in and around it. Uh, there are cameras in the park. 
we're working with the Parks Department to get better cameras. Because the cameras there really didn't pick up as much as we would like, so we want to see if we can get some better cameras in the park. And also, we're working with the local elected to see what cameras we can put outside the park. I have to ask you this. Is the NYPD right now being challenged by this new bail reform law that went into effect January Absolutely. 1st? The NYPD, every law enforcement agency in New York State is being challenged by it. You know, we look at it and we never believe that someone should be held in jail because they don't have money. But we do believe that people who are a danger to the community, who are a danger to you and me and everyone else on the streets, should be able to be held in. And that judges should have that discretion to be able to take a look at a person's history, take a look at the crime that was committed, how it was committed and be able to say that person doesn't deserve to be out on the streets. I mean, you, you've had some incidents where you had this woman in Brooklyn who was released. She was arrested for assault, released because of the new uh, bail reform, and then back in a couple of days later for another assault. Right, and that's something that uh, in the past the judge would be able to use some discretion, say this person's a danger. I need to keep, keep her in. Now, under law, that discretion was taken away from the judges. So it's something that uh, we're looking to have fixed in the current legislative, legislative section. So hopefully that and some of the, uh, some of the discovery rules uh, are going to be problematic if they don't get fixed. Uh, we had an incident just on New Year's Eve of a person run over by a car. Drunk driver runs him over. We weren't even allowed to have the arrest uh, to go forward because the district attorney's office was afraid we wouldn't be able to meet the 15-day discovery laws. So that person was set free without even being processed as an arrest, without even entering the criminal justice system, because he wanted to make sure we had all the evidence in so that the DA's office could meet the 15-day discovery rule. That could be problematic in other cases moving forward. Well, well, this is a battle going on in Albany right now. The session just began, and the Democrats are they're steadfast. They want to keep the reform in place, but the Republicans are fighting against it. Well, I think we've made some headway with a lot of different individuals, because you hear even uh, Governor Cuomo saying that maybe we have to look at it and see what fixes that can go forward. So we're hoping that the right fixes come forward. Because the ultimate goal of any legislation is to keep the citizenry of this city safe. I have to ask you this, with all that's going on in, in Iran and in Iraq right now and these attacks, I mean, I know everyone's on high alert. Here we are in New York. New York's still considered the number one target uh, for terrorists. How safe are we? We have the best counterterrorism unit, uh, I'd say, in the world at this point, and greatest intelligence unit. John Miller running both units, Tommy Galati, uh, Martin Matarasso. We look at information daily. We look at leads. You know, we say, you know, say something, you know, give us a call. If you see something, say something. But well, we get a lot of calls, and our intelligence unit is out there immediately investigating it. We have teams going around to all the different cultural centers around the city making sure we're there, showing a presence, showing a uh, heavy weaponry presence at a lot of different locations. Any known threats, any indication? No anything? credible or known threats in New York City at this time. Good to hear that. On that note, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll be with uh, two uh, Jewish community leaders joining us with uh, Chief Monaghan talking about the spike in hate crimes and anti-Semitism here in New York. We'll be right back. Watching New York's very own PIX11 News Close-Up with Marvin Scott. Here in the city, there was a 26% jump in anti-Semitic crimes last year with no less than 234 incidents, almost a dozen last month alone. Now, that's in addition to the attack on a rabbi's home in Monsey, in which five people were stabbed and the shooting of a kosher market in Jersey City that left three people dead, plus the shooters. Joining Chief Monahan and me right now is Rabbi Mark Schneier, uh, who for the past 30 years has been a leader in helping improve the relationship of key ethnic groups. He's a founder of the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding and Chief Rabbi of the Hampton Synagogue. Evan Bernstein is the New York, New Jersey Regional Director at the Anti-Defamation League, and he is a member of the Governor's Interfaith uh, Council. Thank you for coming in and joining us. This, well, sure. this is, is a serious and it's a mounting problem. Why, why now? Why is there such a spike in anti-Semitic crimes? Well, I believe that's the question we're all asking, particularly with many of these crimes being perpetrated by members of the African-American community. And I think that we need to examine, particularly here in New York, the relationship 
between the African American and Jewish communities. When you go back to the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s, there was no segment of American society that provided as much and as consistent support to Afri African Americans and Dr. King as did the Jewish community. And over the last 15, 20 years, Jewish and African American leaders have been working together in terms of bringing an element of cooperation uh, to our respective uh, communities. Um, but this is particularly troubling and why it is so important that African American leaders, and for that matter, leaders of all faiths and, and other you know, ethnic communities, that they stand with the Jewish community as they are doing in solidarity as our communities are. Now, I know attack. the Anti-Defamation League has come out with a strong condemnation as uh, leaders throughout the state and all across the country. Evan? Yeah, I, th I agree with the rabbi. I think there needs to be better communication. There's definitely been a breakdown over time. I think, you know, what's been a, a spotlight on something that's been happening now in the New York re region for quite some time. If you've looked at the last couple of years, there's been uh, many assaults that have taken place in the community, especially the openly Orthodox Hasidic community has not had a respite. There's been almost a month per month uh, assault. I think the spate that we saw uh, over the, the time of Hanukkah that were bookended, as you said, with Jersey City and then Muncie, I think put more of a spotlight on something that we were already seeing as trends before. And I think there needs to be better communication. And I think you know, there's many faces of anti-Semitism, and a lot of times people want to put everything within white supremacy. I think what's happening in our region now is not white supremacy, and there needs to be a different kind of lens put on it, and certainly different kinds of communication. I think there's gentrification issues. There are other issues that are at play here, also classic anti-Semitic stereotypes that need to be addressed, and, and it has to be more proactive than reactive, and I think we have not been at that stage. We're more reactive, and we, we can't be... Now, like now Chief, it seems to be a disparate group of people committing these crimes with expressing different grievances in, in the attacks that we have seen, either different grievances or, uh, or nothing at all. No, when we take not? a look, and we break down the, uh, the crimes, the anti-Semitic crimes, and we're up 47 crimes for the year, which is dramatic. It's a huge increase. Uh, it's perpetrated a lot by young children. Uh, young teenagers, that's a lot of the criminal mischief, the writing of SWAT stickers, the yelling towards uh, people of the Jewish faith. Uh, also some people who are mentally challenged have been involved in some of the assaults that have taken place of people of Jewish faith. The one thing I, I want to get, and at least here in the city, when we take a look at the crimes that have occurred, uh, there's only been 11 felony crimes, but 11 is way too many. Uh, where someone has committed a, a serious assault on someone, has robbed them, or has grabbed something from them on that person, and working hand in hand with our district attorney's office. So we've been getting consequences, and there needs to be consequences when something like this happens. So we've been getting hate crime indictments, felony indictments on those individuals. And basically, we need someone to go to jail, and that's what we're working hand in hand with our prosecutors to make sure no one should ever fear going to worship someplace, to be able to dress up in their religious garb. No one should ever, ever have that fear. And there needs to be consequences for anyone that's going to perpetrate something. Now, now, now Governor Cuomo has come out. He, he'd like to make these hate crimes an <clears throat> act of terror. Yes. Yeah, and I think it's, listen, I think right now, as long as, you know, the uh, prosecutors and there's actual real legal ramifications in the back end, I think that's certainly the case. In Jersey City, we saw the same thing with Governor Murphy, uh, also trying to call that an act of domestic terror. I think, you know, certainly because just as on, on domestic soil, on our, it's not, it, it still can be an act of terror. And I know there's been a lot of debate on that, but I think anything that's going to enhance, uh, you know, the sentencing and enhance uh, the profile of these crimes is important right now. How much of this do you think is being created by people who have actual hate and those who have mental disabilities, the people out there? I mean, there's some question about the individual in the Monsi attack, whether he actually had a motivation or he would just have a mental problem. Listen, you, you have many, many you know, different kinds of people, types of people committing these crimes, but we're a week out from Martin Luther King Day, and it was Dr. King who understood that a people who fight for their own rights are only as honorable as when they fight for the rights of all people. And thank God here in the city of New York, in addition to the police department, the governor, the mayor, 
we're blessed with community leaders that are standing in solidarity with the Jewish community. I can tell you just last week uh, when Reverend Al Sharpton was unequivocal in denouncing these attacks and when he first spoke to me he was particularly disturbed that these attacks were being perpetrated by members of the African American community and he was joined by a litany of African American ministers and civil rights leaders. That's what we need to see today. We need to see more and more leaders from other ethnic and faith communities standing in solidarity with the Jewish community. Now, there are more of these crimes in, in the last couple of years than they were four or five years ago. How do you respond to the people who suggest it's the political climate right now? We had Mayor de Blasio pointing to the current administration in Washington. We had uh, uh, former Mayor Giuliani pointing to the mayor. You think the politics is what's behind this? Well, today it's very chic. It's very much in vogue. You know, to be pointing fingers, and as my friend Evan said before, there there are a host of reasons um, as to why these anti-Semitic attacks are now coming to the fore. It could be anything from white supremacy uh, to it could be uh, anti-Zionism, which is only uh, a way of you know couching anti-Semitism. There are a host of reasons, and we have to continue to remain vigilant. But one thing Jewish history has taught us that casual Jews become Jewish casualties, and why we need to stand with other ethnic leaders and political leaders here in the city. Let's come together and eradicate what's going on. You need on. that solidarity. I have to take a break. When we come back, let's find out what measures are being taken. I know the NYPD has ramped up its uh, security measures. We'll talk about that when Pix 11 News Close Up continues. Stay with us. Watching New York's very own PIX11 News Close-Up with Marvin Scott. Back now with Chief of the Department Terry Monahan, Rabbi Mark Schneier, and Evan Bernstein of the ADL. Uh, Anti-Semitism, this is not some new phenomenon. This goes back to biblical times. It goes back to, even in, in doing some of my homework, I found that Ulysses S. Grant, back in the 1880 or something, during the Civil War, uh, he banned Jews from entering Tennessee. Tennessee. Is right. that true? First, that's true. You know the story about the Jews accosted by an anti-Semite, and he's accused for having been responsible for sinking the Titanic. So oh. the Jew actually looks at the anti-Semite and said, what are you talking about? The captain wasn't even Jewish. He says, ah, Iceberg, Goldberg, it's all the same. All right, so <laughs> this is not something new to the Jewish people. But what is new is the fact that we're living here in New York, we're living in the blessed United States, we're all about uh, reaching out to others, alliance building, coalition building. Uh, there's probably no greater example of what the Anti-Defamation League continues to do in reaching out to other uh, ethnicities and faith communities so that it's not the Jewish people alone that need to fight this battle but that we have many, many other wonderful partners here in New York and the U.S. to help fight this battle as well. Now, how are we going about now combating this? I know you've ramped up some measures at the NYPD. Yeah, listen, right after Jersey City and then increased even more after Muncie, we put a lot more resources out in our Jewish neighborhoods uh, during service, during worship times, during synagogues, specifically in Williamsburg, Borough Park, and Crown Heights, and Flatbush, and Brooklyn, where we've had these attacks uh, against the Jewish community. We want people not just to be safe, but they need to feel safe. They need to be able to feel that they can go to their synagogues in peace, understand that the NYPD is there for them, that we are going to be out there. It is our job to make sure people stay safe, and more importantly, that they feel safe when they go to worship. Now, you have more security at, at local houses of worship in, in New York and the New Jersey area. What, what measures have you taken at your synagogue in the Hamptons? Well, in the Hamptons, because we're so high profile, we've had that, this kind of security for years now. But even with uh, a heightened security, uh, we've only increased and enhanced the security in terms of bringing in additional security men, in terms of working locally with the uh, police force, uh, so that we are very, very much in a heightened um, sense of alert and sensitivity. 
in terms of um, what is the current situation for the uh, greater Jewish community. Now, what, what advice has ADL put out in, uh, for, for people to take measures to protect themselves against the tax? We certainly, you know, want every institution to kind of do their own self-evaluation. You know, every, every religious institution, whether it's a rabbi, a church, has their own security needs. Their locations are very different. And I think it's impossible to put an overall blanket statement on what is best for every institution. What we do know is right now with the, with the climate that we're in, the institutions need to do that kind of professional evaluation to ensure that they're as secure as possible at this time. But we, I think everyone needs to do it on their own and, and bring the, the best experts in to do that for them. Now, how much of these individuals, I know this is probably a psychological question, how much of these individuals are out there actually hating Jews or blacks or any other ethnic group as much as hating themselves? I guess it's a psychological question. I guess it's a psychological question. Well, of course. I mean, it's, it's a way of making them, uh, elevating themselves. It's a way of making them feel more important by looking, you know, to bring down others. Um, that's classic, not only anti-Semitism, that's an expression of Islamophobia, it's an expression of any form of racism in terms of not being able to address uh, your own situation, trying to make yourself feel better by bringing others down. Yeah, you know, I want to bring in, uh, let me see if we can get this, this video in. I did this last June, and the people who are really impacted, everyone's impacted by these hate crimes, but you look at the people who went through the horror of the Holocaust, and they survived the Holocaust. I met several of them at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Lower Manhattan in June, and if we can, I'll ask my producer if we can see that video, uh, I, I think it's very powerful when you see and you hear what they have to say. Let's take a look at that now. Five Jewish people with a common bond, survivors of the Holocaust whose families were among the millions lost during humanity's darkest hour. They gathered at the Museum of Jewish Heritage to view a living memorial to the Holocaust. The images rekindled thoughts of loved ones lost, Dr. Ruth Westheimer's mother and father among them. Every time I see a picture on Auschwitz, I look if I can see my father, my grandmother, my mother, my the other grandparents, and I've never found them. Ruth Mermelstein and her sister lost six siblings and their parents at Auschwitz concentration camp. I never forget, I never forgive. She still cannot shake the memory of a verbal encounter with another woman. She showed me a pile of ashes and she said, this is where your parents or your whole family. With the dramatic rise in anti-Semitism, she is fearful lessons from the past haven't been learned. It's very frightening to me because this is how it started. I say, please God. He should look down and see to it, you know, that this shouldn't happen again. I couldn't recognize my mother. I couldn't find her in the crowd because I've never seen her without hair. Tova Friedman survived Auschwitz because her mother hid her among corpses. Her parents survived, but 150 family members did not. Tova is fearful of the rise in incidents against the Jewish people. I don't think people realize what hatred and prejudice can do and how far it can go. It's like a cancer. If you don't stop it right now, it'll spread. The two survivors compare the prison numbers tattooed on the arms, and Tova recalls the kindness of a prison guard. She said, I'm going to give you a very small number. So I was five and a half. So if you survive, you can wear a long shirt sleeved and you won't be ashamed of anything. Dr. Ruth sees parallels between the past and present. When I see pictures of children being separated from their families, it makes me cry. That's what happened to me. I waved goodbye to my family and never saw them again. Very powerful. Final thought. I'm a child of a Holocaust survivor. My father went through, Rabbi Arthur Schneier went through the Holocaust. But the game changer today, we're in New York. We are working with the police and other government officials. Chief, law enforcement here and around the country will always be there to give you, keep, provide safety for people. The time of the Holocaust, we had no relation with law enforcement. The fact we're sitting here and having right. this conversation is so important. Thank you for what you do. Chief. Well, thank you all for joining us for your Pleasure. insight. And uh, very important, you see something, say something. And that'll do it for our broadcast this week. I'm Marvin Scott. Thanks so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday, everyone.